From the very first uh, days that you could hardly speak or you began to speak that um, well, cars were something, um, something very exciting, very special and um, that's what it still is today. Like uh, many boys, that, that is something very strangely, but I think you are more or less born with that. England and my favorite cars were of course the cars of the 60s and the 70s, Austin Healey and the D-Type and the MG and also loads of course, Colin Chapman. Uh, I was a big fan of Colin Chapman because uh, what he did um, was totally opposite of what uh, at that time the, the auto industry did. So he, he built a totally different cars and besides that it was different, for me it was a very um, well emotional car. It was very low at the styling of the 30s. Um, if it was the Lotus 7 or the Lotus Europe or the Lotus uh, Elite, I found them fantastic. He was a genius and um, I don't <laughs> think that I am a genius. I do the best I can and maybe when you look at the car that is a well, it's not bad. I once saw a Lotus 7 which was parked in front of a hotel and it was such a different car different to all the other cars which were standing and I saw the I think I, I was age of 16 and I saw that for the first time this Lotus 7 uh, this very low car and and I, and I knew that it was a very very fast car so that was something which uh, was hit which hit me very much and uh, I thought when I have the possibility I um, I'm going to buy one I wanted to become a car designer, but I had no diploma or something. I had no study in that, I had no education in that direction. And so it was more or less a self-made man. I made all kinds of sketches, etc. So when, when I ordered the Lotus 7S uh, as a kit, I had also all kinds of um, modifications in mind. And um, the manufacturer at that time was Arch Motors. I said um, to the importer there, please ask Arch Motors to do this and this modification. I said, well, no problem. And you know how the Inlix are, they, they never see any problem. But I waited and waited and waited, and this special Lotus 7 chassis never came. So I waited a couple of years and then the importer in, in Holland said, I'm going to leave for England. Is this Lotus 7 import, isn't that something for you to do? And of course, as I was very much in love with a, the with a Lotus 7 and I also had uh, an order outstanding, I thought, well, maybe that's a chance of, uh, of uh, getting my, uh, my Lotus 7 at the long last. So then I took over from him and um, well, a few weeks after there, um, there were three police cars coming to my, uh, my workshop at that uh, time. He was selling cars which had no homologation and uh, he said, well, that it's from before the war or something like that, so we don't need that homologation. And then, of course, the people um, of the tax and the uh, people from the homologation, I found out that this, uh, these cars were new cars you are not longer allowed to import these cars the way you do unless you homologate the car according to the laws of today. So that's something which I started to do then. But I found out very quickly that uh, the Lotus 7 never could be homologated. For instance, that um, in Holland they say you need a seat of 55 centimeters and the Lotus 7 had only 40. They say, well, uh, you need some rearward protection uh, in collision and there is now a petrol tank installed. That is also something which is not going. And so there were many more demands which they had. And then, of course, I was more or less um, forced into a situation or to stop or to start all over again with another chassis. So I went to the university. Technical University in Eindhoven at that time in 1977 and um, we started uh, all over again with a chassis and body etc. And in 78 I had my um, 
I had my first uh, car, my first Dongevoort. I thought the name Seven is an, a, a very important name. Um, so I better uh, call it the Seven. And uh, Caterham, who bought in fact the rights of the Seven, he said, well, you have to pay for the name, which was of course very logic. And um, so I paid for the name, but that was something of course which, is, which was quite difficult for the future because they, they want more and more money for that. And then I thought, well, my car is so much different, so why don't use a different name? So that's why I called it, because it was bigger, I thought everything was a little bit bigger, if it was the engine or, the, or, or, or in fact the chassis or, or the dimensions. And therefore I called it 7-8. When I go back 30 years ago, then Caterham said, we like to stick to the original. And um, we said, we like to develop out of the Lotus 7 a different car, a, a more mature car. And um, that's, that's where our two ways separated. They went that way and we went the other way. When we started in 78, um, then we had the heritage of the, um, of the British sports car industry. And um, there was a, a big demand for these cars, but they needed to be much more reliable and comfortable because the Dutch, for instance, but also the Germans, they wanted to go on holiday with their car to the south of France. And they, want, they didn't want to stop somewhere to, that there was a big breakdown somewhere in the, in the technical system. So therefore, um, I had to, um, to incorporate reliability in the car as well as a certain comfort. After a couple of years, we decided to go more to the sportive way. And we started also, well, also the Donkvoort Race Cup, uh, the, the Donkvoort Series, that was in uh, 1990. Mm, after that, 10 years after that, of course, we run into, let's say, a sort of race for horsepower, race for, um, for extreme cars. I think the car which you see today is, um, is also a development out of that period of time. We developed the GT because there was a demand for um, a car with a, with a hard top. But when we were starting designing um, a D8 with a hard top, it became very quickly obvious that you need to restyle the whole car. And when we did the restyle of the whole car, we, like it usual goes, that we thought we better um, also modify the front suspension, better also the rear, we better change the chassis. Well, maybe it's better to put also another engine in it. So from one thing comes to another and you end up with a totally different car. What we did for the first time, um, a lot of composite, uh, carbon fiber also in the chassis. And uh, we thought this is pretty new, so it's, uh, it's maybe a good idea to start racing with a GT to see if it works out and um, that the car is quicker as the D8 and that it's uh, more stable, more, more, more safety in it, etc. So we did with the car, um, the, as you know, the 24 hours Dubai. And uh, the second year, uh, we had success and uh, we won our race because uh, the GT nice car but was not the big success because uh, most of our customers uh, they said we know Dongevoort as an open um, no compromise uh, ultra sportive roadster and not as a, a closed version uh, then I might as well buy other cars for that so we needed to um, to develop a totally different market, different clientele for, uh, for our GT. And um, our, our, our existing uh, customers, they wanted a GT, but without a, without a roof, without a hood. So it became very, uh, very quickly obvious that we have to, uh, to start working on an open version of the GT. And that's what the GTO, Open GT, uh, was, uh, was made of. We have started last year August with the GTO 
and um, we are now on a, on a level of about 25 cars a year. Uh, we ha hope that in a couple of uh, years time that we are doubling or tripling that, uh, that production. Like at this moment the GTO, as you know, that's a quite a fast car. And uh, when other, let's say, well-known or famous drivers who do all kinds of other sports cars and they drive in your car and then they say, well, this Donkervoort is absolutely that something which I've never experienced before. That's something which makes you very proud, of course.